So, also for the uh, the shorter papers as well. Okay. So, uh, some more about the requirements, both for the three short paper, and the sort of the final, only five page paper, but both of those. How many have done at least one write up so far? Uh, how many are planning to do a write up? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so. Uh, there are slightly different rules for the two types of assignments. For the write-up, I'm looking for just two pages. I'm looking for you to uh, reflect back to me what you learned from your chosen speaker. Remember, you get to choose the three out of the course. Um, what you learned about open innovation from that speaker, uh, how the speaker defined the term, what was the significance of open innovation to that speaker. What did, from what your interpretation, what you heard, what were the strengths and the limitations uh, of open innovation from that? So those are the things I'm looking for from the three write-ups. When we get to the final paper, I'm, I want you to step back from individual presenters and reflect what you've learned about open innovation over the course. You'll have, of course, your three write-ups. You will have heard other speakers as well. And so I want you to explain to me this, those same things, but now not in the terms of one presenter, but what you have learned over the, the course. So the definition of open innovation, what you think of uh, the significance of it, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the concept, and so on. Now, the question of should you use the stuff that Professor Chesbro wrote in his book, or should you just ignore it and kind of write what you want? Well, I guess I would like you to at least uh, take note of what I've written about it. And you don't have to agree with it. You're free to disagree with it. But I want you to at least be aware of it. Uh, and if you, based on what you've learned over the, the course of the term, if you think, for example, there's a better definition of open innovation, than the one that I've given, that's great. In fact, I'd say it's a kind of a gutsy move on your part. Um, if you, however, uh, your discussion of open innovation makes me feel like you have no idea uh, the, of what I've written about it, and you, you really are not only making up, but you're sort of pulling it out of your rear end, then that makes me less happy. Because then this, this is a course about trying to learn this stuff. And you'll note that I've tried to blend both people that are doing research on open innovation and people that are practicing open innovation. So I'd love to see some of that theory and practice in your final write-ups as well. How's that? Is that good? OK. Um, second housekeeping item, we're going to end our session today. Our speaker's going to end about 3.35. I'm going to pass out. Uh, an early an evaluation form for the course, uh, things that you like, things that you don't like, uh, just to give me some early feedback on things that maybe we can do to explain, like, like the requirements for the, the write-ups or the paper, uh, or other things that might be able to be done to improve the course. So we'll do that then. Uh, and then third, we have my attendance sheet. I have now updated this for all the enrollments that I know of as of last Friday, so if you think you're enrolled and your name still isn't on the sheet, we should talk. Um, but uh, if you're just attending it and you're not taking it for credit, don't worry about it. But if you are intending to get credit for the course and you aren't enrolled in this page, uh, we need to figure that out. So I'll pass that around as well. OK, so on to today's speaker. Uh, it's really a pleasure of mine to introduce to you Alf Bingham, uh, who is the co-founder and chairman of Innocentive. Uh, and he's going to explain more about Innocentive, innovation incentive, Innocentive. Uh, but his background, I think, is really fascinating because he is one of these science guys who really gets business at a very deep level. And so for those of you who have a technical background yourselves, Alf is, I think, a great role model for folks like you. Uh, he's got a PhD in chemistry from Stanford. Uh, he had a 28-year career at Eli Lilly in the pharmaceutical industry. He did, in fact, help to launch and then spin out 
uh, this company, Innocentive, that you're going to hear more about. Uh, and he really is somebody who I regard as a, a great teacher to me about innovation in general. And last and certainly not least, uh, he and his uh, CEO of Innocentive, Dwayne Spradlin, have a new book out uh, this past year on innovation uh, as well. And are we going to hear more about the book? Um, not, not a lot. Not a lot. It's the Open Innovation Marketplace. But, uh... Yeah, so the name of the book is the Open Innovation Marketplace. If we're not going to hear a lot about it, let me tell you just a tiny bit about it, which is uh, the idea of thinking of putting challenges out to the wider world and think of, if, the, if you get that mechanism working well, how you could begin to work differently as an organization if you could harness and involve lots of other really smart people who aren't on your payroll tackling and solving some of your hardest problems uh, and using that as a mechanism to stimulate innovation. And so the Open Innovation Marketplace really looks seriously at this idea of a challenge as a new way to organize innovative work. Uh, and if Alf wants to say more about that, we'll welcome that as well. So please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Alf Bingham. Yeah, you're mic'd. Um, I'm, I wasn't going to talk about the book per se, you know, so this isn't going to be a book report uh, type thing or a sales pitch to get you to go out and, uh, uh, and order one. Now, the principles that um, Henry talked about and the ones that uh, he knows from a long time discussions with me um, are the principles that I do plan to talk about, and they're, they're, they're elaborated uh, uh, a bit inside. What I want to get to uh, is, is kind of this question, um, will open innovation transform uh, the very models of business? Let me get the full slide view here. Now, I'm not going to do it as you, um, as you might guess. I, I probably have a hypothesis going in, and the hypothesis is yes. And I'm not just going to give you a series of bullet points uh, trying to defend that position, but I want to take you back to what some of the uh, operating principles are. But it looks like we've got some... Hmm. Oh, it looks like it's recalculating. Now, I'm assuming that other thing's going to go away. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it wanted a, a new uh, screen resolution, so I had to pause and do some calculations. So I say, I'm not, not going to give you a set of bullet points. We're going to go back and look at some of the principles. And I want to challenge. I want to challenge some of the notions that you think about innovation. I want to challenge some of the notions by which uh, your employers practice it. Uh, some of the assumptions that they're making, I'd like to make a little more transparent uh, than they are when you're out there in the world and you just assume, well, this is the way it is, uh, of course. And when we look at the sum effect uh, of some of, of those challenged uh, assumptions, uh, I hope that the answer to the question will be uh, fairly conclusive. You know, it isn't happy. It actually came back and asked me if I wanted to reboot, so. <clears throat> I notice our uh, IT guy has slipped out. Yeah, we might bring him back. Yeah, we don't. We're not sure what uh, what it's doing here, but we might have to go ahead. Uh, I can only imagine the number of Excel spreadsheets and Word documents and PowerPoint uh, presentations that I just lost. Uh, 
because I'm one of those people that keeps a, you know, keeps a very crowded desktop, whether it's the physical one uh, or the electronic one, but that's okay. We Now, this is not the, um, this is not the uh, login ID, so we've got to log out and log back in. Oh, okay. You've got, yeah. yeah. Back it up. Plug it in. You can anytime you want. It's okay with me. But it's somewhere. It's plugging that in that uh, seems to confuse it a bit. Although, here, look, we're back. We're back pretty well here. Sorry about the uh, disruption there. The, um, I, want to I want to introduce our business, and I'm going to take you back to the principles, but first I want you to understand what kind of a company uh, I, I'm, I'm involved in. Uh, it was uh, part of a whole transformation effort at Lilly. We launched seven different companies. I'm only going to use one of them uh, as an example of... Uh, went back to do its little uh, recalculation there. It's essentially a bounty hunting company. So what we did was we, when we launched it, we said there are some problems that we work on repeatedly inside. And one of the experiences I'd had in, back in my graduate student days was coming in, taking a class like this one, not this big, there were 21 students in it, and they gave us one problem a week. And we would tackle that problem and we would come back We'd submit the answers to the one problem we were given. We would, we would get together. They'd have been graded. We'd show up in this uh, evening class that uh, met in a, in a gazebo, a kind of uh, round table uh, conference area. And the professor would go up and write five names on the board. Now, if your name appeared on the board, it meant that out of the 21 students, you were one of the five that was going to go up explain the way you tackled the problem, explain the answer you came to, and defend it against the criticisms of the faculty and the rest of the class. Now they had hand-picked these five in advance because they knew somewhere buried in the solution was either something so clever that they thought the other class members ought to hear about it and benefit from it, or something so stupid that they thought that that evening should turn into a cautionary tale as to why nobody would ever make a mistake like that again in the future. So you saw your name on the board, and you didn't really know which end of the spectrum you were going to be on. But what I learned is that 21 smart people can have 21 different approaches to a sufficiently complex problem. And then I graduated. I took a job. I went in the lab. And problems that weren't completely unlike the ones I'd been assigned were given to me, and I was told, solve this problem. Now, they always got my best effort, but I always wondered where those other 20 solutions were. Because some nights I was up there on the board as having a very clever solution, and some nights I was up there as a cautionary tale, and lots of nights I wasn't, while others were up there with ingenious solutions. And even though I was reasonably good at my craft, I thought, you know, I don't know what the other 20 possible solutions to this problem might be. I can't think of those other 20. I don't have the experiences and the knowledge that led those other 20 students to come up with completely different approaches. And as I went through my career and I kept being handed problems, I kept saying, this is a horrible shortcoming. I, I'm giving the best solution I know how, but I know that if this problem was exposed to more minds, better solutions would come up. Then along comes this thing toward the end of my career called the Internet. And the internet suddenly gave us the capability of broadcasting problems to a huge number of people. And I thought, I can find what those other 20 ideas are going to be. And so we talked with McKinsey and others about, you know, has this idea got any merit? And they, they said, oh, we could analyze this for another million dollars after the first million you've already spent. And afterward, we wouldn't really have a better idea. Why don't you launch the company? and we'll see what happens. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a report as to what happened when we launched the company. But I'm going to illustrate it by just giving you an idea of, well, what sort of problems fall into this category 
of their complex enough that everybody could have a different solution. So I'm going to start off by using the Air Force Research Labs. The, the Wright Brothers Institute uh, in Ohio is one of our, our customers. And they come up with some problems I would probably have never thought to ask given my, my background. And I'll just use that as a way of getting started. And then we'll delve down into some of the principles um, that are articulated here. So here were the first uh, four challenges um, that the Wright Brothers Institute posed to us. The first one is we'd like to understand how to do remote human demographic characterization. This is not facial recognition. Facial recognition is about zeroing in um, on you and then recognizing you and pulling up your social security card and your driver's license and things about you. Demographic characterization is about taking a photograph of this entire classroom and coming back and saying, we think it's a course in business management at the Haas School at Berkeley. Okay, how is it that this combination of ethnic groups and backgrounds, genders, and everything else, uh, attention and all of these kinds of factors would enable us to come to a conclusion about that? And I think you can see where the Defense Department might be interested in being able to read the intention of crowds um, all at once. So that was one problem um, that they, they gave to us. And just to give you a little idea, they gave us the problem on the 2nd of March last year. They said, we want it solved by the, uh, by the 2nd of May. We're going to give you two whole months uh, to solve this problem. We'll pay $200,000. And when I took this screenshot, and I don't know what date I took this screenshot on, 670 individuals from a large crowd had signed intellectual property agreements and said, I've got a potential answer to that. I'd like to make um, some contribution to you. Now, I don't remember how many finally got submitted. But I just want you to get a flavor for the kinds of problems. The second one was a vehicle stopper. How can we take a, a traveling vehicle, make it stop? We don't want to damage the vehicle. We don't want to damage the occupants of the vehicle. We just want it to stop. Um, design and simulation of an accurate shooter locator. I mean, sadly enough, this is one of the real problems they have. If I'm uh, a member of uh, military or even civilian operations and uh, a bullet hits the wall beside me, it's important for me or those who are protecting me to know where that bullet came from um, very quickly. And as you know, um, bullets travel faster than the speed of sound. So um, being able to respond to this uh, in some way that within the physical limitations uh, was an important part of what they were looking for. And again, you've learned how to read what those numbers are. And then the other one is that uh, a lot of what happens in times of conflict um, is an attempt to enroll non-combatants um, to your side, whichever side you might be on. Um, you want to enroll the non-combatants to your side. So, um, you know, if uh, you, the U.S. Uh, is involved in one of these conflicts, uh, we may be also, um, you know, realizing that this was disruptive to food and water supply, is we may also be delivering uh, food and water uh, to, to local residents during an event like this. The problem is, of course, there are many ways to disrupt uh, these airdrops and make them ineffectual, and the Air Force was looking for ways of how can we ensure uh, that the right materials get to the right people uh, in a conflict environment. So I think you can see that these are generally rich problems. They're complicated. Um, they would certainly be open to a diverse, diverse way uh, of thinking about them and uh, tackling them, and that this might be just the sort of thing uh, that where if I were to expose them to more than whoever's job it was in the Air Force to figure this out, um, I might get answers that are very worthwhile. Now, as, as I go through um, some, of these, some of these examples, I'm going to leave plenty of time at the end because I, I want you to challenge um, these thoughts and I want you to disagree with me and I want you to bring, uh, bring up some um, either supportive or counterpoints and I'm going to make sure there's time to do that but at the same time if you have questions in the course of the delivery here uh, stop I'm happy to pause clarify um, or, or elaborate on things that I didn't make uh, as clearly as I should. Now over time this is a sampling just a sampling um, we've worked with the Harvard Catalyst, that's their medicine program. We've worked with Rockefeller Foundation, NASA. You can see on here everything from uh, publi publishers 
this is the venture capital arm uh, of the CIA. Uh, this is a, a foundation to treat Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, a couple pharmaceutical companies appear on here, some, some companies you may not recognize which are uh, like European versions of Procter & Gamble, consumer product companies, and others. So the examples I'm going to be drawing from have been explored across, across a fairly wide spectrum, not only of commercial entities, but government agencies and, um, and not-for-profit foundations as well. Now, to begin um, delving into what some of the principles are uh, that govern this. I, I want to challenge the whole notion that caused you to come to graduate school to enroll in these courses, to pay your tuition, and to walk out of here with an additional two or three letters uh, attached to your name that is supposed to speak something uh, about your capabilities, whether it's PhD in chemistry or MBA or whatever it might be. It's supposed to be a signal to the world at large of what you're uniquely capable in. And, and, and that's going to be true, but the problem is that we assume that the inverse of that argument is true. Therefore, the people that are capable of working on my problem will have those degrees, and that's why I should hire the way I'm going to hire. And it's this inverse argument that while well, while the first may be true, the second may not be entirely true, and I will show you um, why, in fact, we have data that says it is not. Um, and I'm going to illustrate this uh, by use of, a, of an image that's increasingly familiar, especially to people studying business in the Internet age, and that's the long tail. Now, we kind of know the long tail from the writings of uh, Clay Shirky, um, I actually hoped I had a, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'd, I'd hope that I'd, I'd, I'd sequence the slides uh, in such a way that the next one was going to uh, be a quote from Amazon, but I, I will, I will start to develop what the uh, tail content is um, here in a minute. Let me apply it specifically to the area of expertise. If I use as the y-axis here, a measurement which is the likelihood of solving a tractable domain appropriate problem to be posed in the future. That's a terrible definition and it actually means that this is a probability along this axis. So this becomes a probability density function for those from tech backgrounds that that, that makes plenty of sense to. This becomes a probability density function and the way the x-axis is arrayed is I start with the most qualified or the most likely to solve a problem and that's Sally and so Sally is the height here on the left side of my chart that defines the most qualified most appropriate individual to solve this problem now you say that's a terrible definition but that is effectively the definition everybody uses when hiring employees because if it's not a problem to be posed in the future, they just hire a consultant to solve the problem today, they're never going to see it again. They hire accountants because they think accountants are going to be able to solve accounting problems that haven't occurred yet somewhere in the course of their career. They hire chemists because they think they're going to have a chemistry problem. In fact, they think they're going to have a whole series of chemistry problems over and over again. And this individual is going to be qualified to solve those problems that haven't even been posed yet. That's basically the basis upon which we always hire. And we're going to see what some of the flaws in that are. So you understand the axis, the probability of solving the problem. I've got the names of everybody. Now, I start to get off to some really little ones over here, you know. This may be young children growing up in Romania. And the, the thing about this curve is it just keeps going and going and going. And it never quite approaches zero. Zero, meaning no chance whatsoever. It gets very, very small. It gets ridiculously small, um, but it never quite hits zero. Now, as we were walking over here, Henry paused and says, I want to show you something here. He says, do you see all these parking spaces that say NL reserved? Do you know what that stands for? And naturally, not having been a member of the Berkeley campus, I didn't know. He says, they're reserved for Nobel laureates. Okay, so um, you have a system, you work in a system, you live in a system that 
reverences what's over here on the left side of the chart. And in some ways, the reverence of what's on the left side of the chart has distorted our opinion of the way things work. And I'm going to uh, show you the extent to which that's happened. Now, I'm going to begin by dealing with the left side. And so I've expanded it. You know, all I've done is just take the left side of this so it's a little easier to see that it's made up of individuals. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to start with a, a, a quote from Bill Joy. Uh, who says, most of the smart people work somewhere else. Now, that was the first little bit of paranoia uh, that was trying to be injected into a system in which we take great comfort in the way in which we hire and we bring the smart people to us. Now, whatever field this might be, Bill Joy obviously made the comment in the context of computer science, and he recognizes that there were professors of computer science that don't work for his company, and that there were um, there were graduates of computer science that worked for competitor companies. And so we might start by just looking at these uh, brightly colored um, orange and yellow bars as the people we've been able to recruit. Now we stayed over on the left side of this chart, right? We didn't go to the right side of this chart because those would be individuals not perceived as terribly well qualified to solve our computer science problems. So we stayed over here to where the probability was at some threshold level and above. They had the MBAs, they had the PhDs, they had the qualifications, and we viewed this as the competitor uh, space. And Joy just simply recommend, reminds us that most of it's blue. They don't work uh, inside of our, our company. Now, the reason I've color-coded them in orange, now all I've done is just collapse all those colors so you can see the relative areas uh, of things, but you know, it's still the same chart. I've just bunched the colors together uh, in a different orientation so you can see them. So these are the smart people that work for someone else. These are the smart people that work for us. And the ones that I've left in yellow are the smart people that we typically assign any problem to. This was my experience living graduate school and finding out that 20 other smart people who could have worked on and had independent ways of solving my humanitarian airdrop problem or whatever it was weren't even in the room when the problem was assigned. They never knew the problem existed. So this is the way we actually practice work in innovation in the world, whether it's a commercial entity, a not-for-profit, a government, or even an academic institution. We assign the problem to this tiny yellow slice. The others in our organization don't even know about it and most of the smart people aren't anywhere uh, to be found. They actually work for somebody else. Now before we get into this other part of the, of the chart, okay, I've just kind of given you the rationale for, for why hiring smart people, um, experts, uh, is a good idea. But before we get into this other part, let me, let me use this as a way of articulating what the properties of a long tail function are. The properties of a long tail function are such that most of the actual volume is lost over here on the right. And the reason that these appear in Wired Magazine, the reason we've got something like a power function existing in our, in our current uh, culture is because of this property right here expressed by uh, Amazon employee Josh Peterson. We sold more books today that didn't sell at all yesterday than we sold today of all the books that did sell yesterday. Now, that's an awkward wording. You've got to stop and you've got to think about it. Um, but what's he saying? He's saying that there are books that nobody bought on Sunday and that, and that today, or, or on Sunday, I sold more books that had never, now, let's see, how does it say this again? <laughs> that didn't sell at all yesterday. We're gonna sell more books on Monday, of which we sold none on Sunday, than we're gonna to sell today that did sell some books on Sunday. You gotta stop and think about how backward this is if you decide to go into business and open a book kiosk at the mall, okay? What are you gonna put on your shelves if this is a true statement about business? How could you possibly figure out what books are going to be bought that day? No, that's not how you're going to run your business, is it? 
what are you going to put on your shelves? You've got, I don't know, 200 linear feet uh, of shelf space or something. And it's actually what's driving you is not the books people want to buy. What's driving you is the fact that you've only got 200 feet of space. So you've got to think about this as a problem in scarcity. How can I put on my shelf the things that are most likely to sell? So you're going to start using some rules to do this. One of the rules you're going to use is, is it on the New York Times bestseller list? Because my belief is that if I've got to have a book on this shelf and it's going to use up one of the valuable two inches of space, I ought to get a book that sells a lot. And so I'm going to put New York Times bestsellers on. If Oprah Winfrey on her TV show or her network mentions any book, I'm going to go out and buy 10 copies of it and put it on 24 inches of my shelf space because that book is going to sell. But do you see that your whole business strategy is driven not by the plentifulness of books and titles, it's driven by the scarcity of shelves. And, and thinking about the world in terms of what's scarce is what leads us to exactly the same decisions we were making about who we hire to work on and solve any problem. It's why we have reserved parking spaces for Nobel laureates, okay? Because this is about the scarcity of both the individual and the scarcity of, of space uh, that's available. Now, I said I wasn't going to spend a lot of time talking about the book, and I'm not, but I am going to give you a quote from the book. What we've learned is that distributed in a previously unsearchable crowd are insights, flashes of genius, and ideas that would never be evident on job applications, resumes, or consulting brochures. They hinge upon the uniqueness of every human experience and the chaotic way in which aha moments are distributed among persons of widely varying academic and career qualifications. Now, this is a statement about Josh Peterson and the books that Amazon sold. This is not a statement about what's the right way to run a bookstore. But when you start thinking about business, you can view your business as a scarcity of capital, a scarcity of roles and positions, employee slots in the company, or you can view it as the plenty of available resources um, that are all around the world. Now, how that translates into the image we were looking at before is now I've stopped focusing only on the left side of this curve. And while the height here is so low that it says any one of these individuals marked off here in green has a far less probability of solving my problem than a Nobel laureate or a Stanford PhD or a Berkeley MBA or whatever else it is that I'm using as my metric of qualification. While the probability of any one solving that problem is very low, the cumulative probability that the problem will be solved by somebody in that category is much greater. Okay, Because if I were to expose a problem to the world as a whole and allow anyone to solve it, then these would have an equal shot as these. Now another reason, there's, there's two more reasons, two more ways of thinking about, nah, he can't be right. And if he is, we should have taken that into account and all kinds of, you know, free market forces should have, should have caused this distribution. But one of the ways to think about why I'm what I'm telling you is true and yet it's not the way we've evolved, in, in addition to this scarcity plenty argument, is, is a statement that was made by the author of Guys and Dolls. Um, what's his name? Hmm, I didn't put it on one of the slides. I'm going to get his name um, later. Um, but you've probably seen or know, know at least about um, the Broadway play, the movie Guys and Dolls. It's about betting. Uh, and so it, it is actually a statement on placing bets. Um, Damon Runyon, that's who it was. What Damon Runyon said is, the race is not always to the swift, nor the victory to the strong, but that is how you bet. 
Now it's this whole notion that when you're hiring someone, you're betting. And you're betting on them coming in and being a part of your organization and making a contribution. You know what? You should be hiring over here on this side of the curve. Because if you've got to bet, if you've got to place your money down in advance, you are better off having that NL in his or her reserved parking spot uh, than you are having one of these individuals from over here. So the fact that we've evolved that way really does say something um, logically uh, about why we did so. But if I'm right, and this green area is larger than the volume of this blue and orange area, then that means that whenever I post a problem, something, and I told you before this was a probability density distribution, and those of you who are used to thinking about that realize that what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to sample it. In other words, the person that solves the problem is going to be picked from this whole area, not based on how high the y value is, but from this whole area. And if the green is really more voluminous than the blue and the orange and the yellow, then that means that there will be a more likelihood that when problems are posted, worked on by others, that it's somebody who was not, in our definition, qualified to have solved it. I can tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll spoil the punchline right now. About 95% of the time, about 95% of the time, when we post a problem, you saw those Air Force problems, you saw where we had 670 people agree to work on it. Let's say 67 of those 670 actually write it up and make a submission. And then we take and we strip all identifiers off of those submissions. We don't tell them where they came from. We don't tell them what gender they are. We don't tell them what degrees they hold. We don't tell them what their qualifications are. We tell them nothing about it. We hand those 67 submissions to the company that was looking for that answer or the government agency. And we say, what's the best solution? They hand it back to us and they go, this is the one that's best. We issue the bounty, we give the award, and then we look at their resume, we look at their gender, we look at their nationality, and the answer is it's coming from this region 90 to 95 percent of the time. A person would never have been qualified to have been hired by the company to solve that problem, and that's who solved it. Clarification? Yeah. It's always going to be true because, because um, what you're asking about is the ratio of having been one versus the length of the x-axis here, which you'll notice that most of the submissions will come from this region. So, so it's not disproving uh, what you said. In fact, it, it in some ways is reinforcing. There's, n there's nothing too magical. I'm going to talk about a few ways to understand why problems get solved this way, but it's not too much magic. It, 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 in some ways, you could even ar you just argue it like this. The reason the problem comes from, an un the solution comes from an unqualified individual is because there are just so damn many more unqualified individuals than there are qualified individuals, okay? But the problem is that because we, we built companies and institutions on these laws of scarcity around expertise, on the number of seats we had, desks, Whatever, whatever your argument by the number of potential salaries we could pay in a given week, because we built them on the logic of scarcity, it turns out what we discovered was that the region which has the most potential cumulatively for solving the problem has never been utilized. Yeah. No. It's not static, and you're right. And, and it really depends on what problem I ask as to where you are. So as an individual, you're not like stuck at one part on here because it really depends on what problem I'm talking to you about. You, you as an individual are here sometimes, and quite honestly, you're here sometimes, okay? And so the individuals aren't, aren't locked down uh, to any one place. And even on the problem of note, they're moving. Um, I'm gonna come to some examples from NASA 
and when I give you the examples from NASA, let's, let's, let's talk about you know, what, what became of these individuals. Did NASA then say, oh, you are a genius, I want to hire you, or you know, how, how did that dynamic start working? Did you move on the chart? It can be teams. It can be teams. Uh, we, we basically don't dictate any of that. We leave that up to um, individuals. We know that people self-form teams. We know they form little uh, you know, problem-solving parties like Tupperware parties. We know that just about every imaginable uh, way of tackling the problem goes on out there in the network somewhere. Yeah? Do the uh, individuals or teams submitting see each other's submissions, or are those kept Private. There's two, there's two uh, ways we do it. We, we have um, a challenge type, and we're getting into some mechanics of the, uh, of, of the business here. We have ones in which um, we don't want you to see what other people are submitting. You've got intellectual property attached to it. We don't want to get cross-licensing uh, cross issues going. And so we run it like in a very hub-and-spoke model. Now, at the end of a spoke, there might be a team. It's not necessarily an individual, but we manage it in a hub-and-spoke model. Uh, there's another type of, of challenge. We happen to use the name prodigy to describe them, uh, but it's, it's just a word uh, in which what we do is we actually run it as a series of competitions, and once a best solution has been put forward, we publish that best solution and then see if knowledge about the best solution to a problem inspires people to find incremental improvements on that uh, solution as well. So we bootstrap uh, our way up in that particular class of uh, challenges. Yes? It's, it's a great question, and there are parts of the answer to your question that we can't really separate out, like, you know, do the smartest people just go, well, well they didn't come and ask me personally, so to hell with them. I'm not going to even work on their problem, all right? There is probably a little bit of that dynamic. That sounds like human nature to me, so I don't know how to completely separate that out. But I am going to try to give you a little bit of insight into the green portion of the curve and, and why the green portion of the curve. I mean... There is the simple, well, it's just so much bigger. It's so much longer. You know, no wonder there's room for more green. It just keeps going. Um, but I want to give you a, a little bit more nuance of an answer to that. Um, how, however, I don't want you to completely shake the fears you have about your overly expensive MBA. Um, not completely. And, and I do want you to recognize, though, that your MBA is going to buy you something which is position in line for many of these problems. You know, the fact that most of our nuclear physics problems were given to nuclear physicists, so most of them got solved by nuclear physicists, is just as bad an artifact as the one that you're speculating on, which is, but it was just solved by people who had spare time on their hands because they weren't qualified to be nuclear physicists. So, you know, keep in mind that the existing system has got some of the same counter-arguments that maybe it's just because of where people earn themselves the place in line uh, and not truly uh, their innate skill in this. So I, I want to talk about what I call the three itties, which is where does the solving power come from in a crowd? And I want to talk about heterogeneity, marginality, and serendipity um, as the three specific itties for, for why crowds appear to be smart. Now this is actually one of the um, this is actually one of the NASA challenges, and I got to tell you when we post a challenge from NASA we use their name. When we post a challenge from Procter and Gamble we don't tell people it's a challenge from Procter and Gamble. It's one of the ways of maintaining confidentiality for Procter and Gamble so their competitors don't know what they're working on. But also we're not sure that putting Procter and Gamble is going to motivate somebody to go, Wow, I'd love to solve a problem for Procter and Gamble. However, when we post a challenge for NASA, believe me, there are people that come out of the woodwork and go, I get to work on a problem from NASA? That's so cool. I've wanted to be an astronaut ever since I was six. You know, and they will tackle these problems. Plus, not only does NASA pay $20,000, they give you a VIP invitation to a space launch if you win. No way to put money on that. Priceless, as they say. So, so this is an example of a NASA challenge. But these are where the... Uh, solvers 
uh, engaged from. Okay, we call the, the community out there individually as solvers. This is where the solvers engage from. Now, I don't know what NASA's consulting, contracting strategy is, but I can virtually guarantee that there are dots on this map where they are not looking for people to work on the kinds of problems that NASA has. And yet, this is what happened when we just opened it up um, to the world as a whole, where people self-selected and said, I have a contribution uh, to make to NASA. So this, this, the sheer heterogeneity of this means that you're going to get viewpoints on solving a problem that you cannot have and you cannot afford an internal corporate strategy to try to go out um, and tackle the world in this fashion. You've got to actually build an attractor and let the world come to you. There's no push mechanism that gets you this level of heterogeneity. The second principle is marginality. And um, I've got a quote here from a colleague I work with quite a bit at uh, Harvard Business School, Kareem Lakhani, um, who in some private conversation was actually talking about this paper by McLaughlin called optimal marginality. If you just think about the juxtaposition of those two words, optimal marginality, you can see this is not going to be a completely intuitive concept. It talks about innovation and orthodoxy in Frime's revision of psychoanalysis. So he's working in the, in the field of sociology and psychology as he begins to formulate these notions around how does marginality contribute. And as Kareem said, because individuals become socialized to the norms and beliefs of their fields and organizations, remaining at the margins while keeping up to date and actively pursuing access to resources offers those marginalized a different set of perspectives and heuristics than those at the core of the professional establishment. And this comes down to you can't teach anybody how to do something without also teaching them how not to do it. If you roll in, enroll in a PhD program, um, particle physics, at Berkeley, they're going to teach you how to do particle physics. And you're not going to stop and realize it, but they're also telling you how not to do it. Because all the ways that are different from the ways they're teaching you are the ways they're saying not to do it. And so being strongly socialized inside of your field is also a way of learning what not to do. And look, you know history. You know um, the theories of Thomas Kuhn. You know that major breakthroughs almost always come when put forward by those who were not socialized into the institution of their fields or their organizations. And so this notion of marginality, the people in the green are living in margins. Um, Kareem is actually pursuing an interesting hypothesis as well, which is we recognize that in society, not all classes of people are equally socialized. There are some classes of society that tend to get marginalized because of our very culture. Certain ethnic groups can be more readily marginalized. Women versus men, especially in the world of innovation, commercial innovation, can be somewhat marginalized. Kareem's made the observation that while women may be more reluctant to submit a solution to a challenge, they're more likely to win if they do. Their ideas come, and so he's, he's trying to tie together whether the entire sociology of marginalization and the performance of people in these large crowd-oriented systems um, actually uh, correlate. And the third one is, is serendipity. And in order to illustrate uh, serendipity, uh, I want to go back and uh, retell uh, a story that is sort of the prototypic example of serendipity. It's the, it's the example that was used by your uh, technology or your science teachers, your, your uh, innovation classes, uh, uh, anything you've ever done on creativity, and that's the story of Archimedes. So somebody in the classroom remember the story of Archimedes? What did Archimedes come up with? I know he came up with that inclined plane and screw thing, um, but he came up with another law that's actually called the Archimedean principle. Yeah. Like when he went into the bathtub and water spilled out and he ran out naked, crying 
Yeah, <laughs> that's a very shortened <laughs> version uh, of the story, but it, it's accurate um, in, all, in all the facts along the way. And, and if more science was practiced today that resulted in people screaming naked through the streets, um, shouting Eureka, um, we might have some advances on global warming or something that uh, you know, still elude us. The, a, a little more detailed uh, version uh, of the story, which ends the same way, is that Hero, um, H-I-E-R-O, who, who actually carried a business card that said Tyrant of Syracuse, because tyrant in those days was actually a governmental title uh, that you could have given if you had certain amounts of uh, absolute power. Um, he was the Tyrant of Syracuse, and he had a crown made. And, he, and, the, and the way he had the crown made is he took gold to an artisan, and he said, you know, form, form this into a crown for me. He gets the crown back, and he's thinking, oh, that's good, good, nice-looking crown. I like this. And, uh, and then he gets to thinking, oh, I wonder if that artisan ripped me off. You know, I gave him 24 ounces of gold. He takes the crown off, and he weighs it. He weighs 24 ounces. He puts the crown back on. And he's happy for a little while, and then he thinks about it a little bit more, and he goes, wait a minute. You know, we know this thing called alloys, where you could take away part of the gold, replace it with lead. It still look a lot like gold, except half my gold is sitting under the artist's mattress, and half of it has come back to me as a crown, uh, diluted with lead. And so he also was knowledgeable enough to know that the density would be different. But in order to get the density of the crown, he has to have not only its weight, but its volume. And so he takes this oddly shaped crown to somebody who was reasonably skilled in the, in the sciences, and he said, what's the density of my crown? Can you tell me what the volume is so that I can answer the question of whether or not I've been ripped off? And Archimedes says, you know, there's no way to measure the volume of an irregularly shaped object. If this was a cube or a sphere or a cone, I would have the formulas to measure its volume. But there is no way to measure the volume of an irregularly shaped object. I don't think Hero was very happy. Um, Archimedes gets home, and then we remember the part of the story. Um, you can see my Photoshop skills are mediocre at best. Um, he's not even naked. I just stuck in, you know, the Archimedes picture. You know, you can't find any pic naked pictures of Archimedes on the web. You'd think with as much diversity as we have out there, they would be available, but they're not. Um, Archimedes climbs into the tub, and as he's lowering himself in the tub, he has the same experience many of you have had. Did I overfill it as you're watching the volume go up and up and up on the side of the tub? Is it going to overflow? And then it occurs to him, uh, just as you said, that he was measuring the volume of his irregularly shaped body as he lowered it into the tub. Now, there's a lot of complexities around buoyancy and, uh, and, and you know, density that get, get mixed up in there. But mathematically, it's just the equivalent um, of, the, of that familiar displacement experience uh, that you've all had. He screams, Eureka, Eureka, jumps out of the tub, doesn't bother to get dressed, and he's running down the street saying, I found it, I found it. So he came up with this way of solving the problem. Now, the important thing uh, I, I think to recognize here is that this was not Archimedes' first bath. Okay? That's what's wrong with this story, is they all tell you about how it was this ingenious event and lowering himself into the tub, and he solves this great problem, and if you all go take a bath, you'll solve world hunger, or you sit under a tree and an apple will hit you and you'll solve gravity, or you'll fall asleep dreaming of snakes and you'll solve aromatic uh, molecular structures, or you know wh whatever the story is. And we've got dozens or hundreds of these stories about serendipity, is they don't stop to say, well, how did the serendipity actually happen? The bath was important. The, the basic skill and training was important, but so was the challenge. So was the fact that Hero brought this to him. Because all those other baths he'd taken, he knew there wasn't a way to measure the volume of irregularly shaped objects, and he didn't discover anything while sitting in the tub. But the clear articulated need, and it probably didn't hurt that this was somebody who could lop his head off uh, just out of his displeasure, brought together a crystallization of this external event, the need, the skill, and a solution appeared. Now, I don't know any way to train serendipity 
into a group of problem solvers. I don't know any way to take an organization that I'm responsible for and make them more serendipitous than they were last year. But what I do know is that in a broadly exposed challenge, there are going to be people that take baths, that lower a leg of lamb into hot water on the stove, and they're going to take the challenge that I had, coupled with their skills and abilities, coupled with the events that are going on in their life, and these serendipitous events are going to occur. And my record that I have, and, and by the way, just so you know the numbers, we've done it about 1,400 times. So, you know, N, N isn't six. Um, N's enough that I've got some statistically meaningful results. And I get, you know, emails back that kind of start with the, well, I was thinking about tear gas, and then I read your problem, and the next thing you know, I suddenly had this brainstorm, and I submitted, did, was it a problem about tear gas? No, it wasn't a problem about tear gas. Um, but it was just this way in which um, experiences and other things couple uh, to produce these serendipitous events. And I don't know of an organized way of doing it except to get the exposure um, and let nature uh, and all of its occurrences kind of take care of it for you. Now, I surfaced when we were talking about Archimedes, uh, the criticality uh, of a challenge. And we didn't appreciate this when we began. Remember, we began with nothing more than uh, kind of a, a graduate school experience. Where are those other 20 people uh, that ought to make a, a reasonable contribution to this problem? We didn't really think about how well the problem was articulated or the way in which it was articulated and the role that played. And, you know, we, we got out there, we started to see some problems drew more traction than others, and we started to ask questions. And, wait, if, if it is a marginal field, how does one, how does one start to exploit um, marginality? And so um, we, we, we found a body of literature brought to us by Paul Carlyle, one of our advisors, and, and he says, well, challenges are acting as boundary objects. And, and I said, Paul, you know, what do you mean when you, when you say a boundary object? And he goes, well, we could talk about the boundaries of discipline. You know, well-articulated challenge will help somebody from a biology background solve a physics problem, or someone from a physics background solve a biology problem. You know, fields that have got enough in common that they can talk to each other but are diverse enough that you don't get socialized into the same ways uh, of thinking about all the problems in there. He says, the other, the other way to think about a boundary objects is they're that clay form that automobile designers use, you know? Um, you've got blueprints that long ago preceded this clay form, but even you can see looking at that clay form that if your job is to design the um, speedometer gauge on the dashboard, you're going to be looking to reflect some of the curvature and some of the lines and keep the whole thing in a, in a harmonious design. And you're probably not going to be capable of doing that until you can crowd around your colleagues and touch and feel and actually interact with this boundary object. So Paul says, you know, really what it comes down to is, is boundary objects almost always provide a way, a, a boundary between different pieces of time and different pieces of space. Or, as I would say, why did Archimedes discover what he discovered there and then instead of here and now? You know, why did it occur at the time it occurred? And if you think about innovation in any setting, business, government, not-for-profit, the goal is to cause something. I mean, do we really think that most of the problems that we innovate, you know, that that there would never have been an iPod, ever, 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 anything like that if it hadn't been for Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was something that caused an iPod to occur here and now as opposed to there and then. It wasn't that it was completely outside the ken of human imagination, but he was the boundary object uh, which, which caused it to occur at a certain time in a certain space. In addition, um, and this gets back to some of the comments uh, raised at the beginning about transforming uh, business, in addition to becoming a fundamental basis of problem solving, this here, here, now, there, and then argument, challenges also become a way of distributing inventive work. Um, 
I, you know, the examples I gave you from Air Force early on were ways of taking small nuggets of what the Air Force has to accomplish in its overall mission and distributing them into a population. You saw the slide uh, of NASA in which it got distributed into a far bigger uh, organization than was possible to even build, uh, build inside. I think we kind of covered that. So I want to I want to jump to some examples from NASA kind of under the title it really is rocket science. NASA's problems and I'm not going to go through them in any in any detail keeping food fresh in space, the coordination of sensor swarms, forecasting of solar events. Um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to just pick a couple of these and tell you a little bit about the way the problem was solved um, and who solved it and and then you know to to also illustrate uh, this notion of um, why, how often it comes from the green. So NASA has actually worked on the data forecasting or the data driven forecasting of solar events. You know we've just recently had a fairly major bit of solar weather, right? Um, responsible for a great increase in the northern lights, lousy cell phone coverage, uh, a few other things if we'd had astronauts uh, up extravehicular in space, um, added hazard and risk and danger to them. Um, so these uh, these solar events are something that NASA has worried about for 30 years. And NASA has worked on this problem continuously for 30 years. They gave it to us and they said, you know, we could always do better. Um, let's see what you can do. And in 120 days, we, we did better than anything they had done uh, in 30 years. Now, who solved the problem? It was a guy by the name of Bruce Cragen. Um, Bruce Cragen, you just have to take my word for it, did not have the resume that uh, NASA would have ever considered hiring uh, or employing as a contractor. In fact, Bruce Cragen had been a you know, mid-level engineer for the Sprint Telecom Company. Um, and even though he knew about solar events as problematic in cell phone, it wasn't his job to do anything about, uh, about those solar events. Um, however, once he retired, uh, he bought a little uh, farm or a little piece of property up in uh, rural New Hampshire uh, and was kind of sitting around wondering what he was going to do and he was surfing the web one day and he found our website and he found this challenge and he says, oh, you know, I'd, I'd had some speculative theories on that about, about the magnetic properties of the earth and the magnetic properties of the sun and the way the two couple together and these are areas that NASA had never explored before and then Bruce says, you know, back a long time ago, I was doing some work um, um, when I was a student on comets, and I'd come up with some very complex data, and I'd come up with some visualization techniques for looking at the data. What if I look at NASA's data on solar forecasting through those same lenses, and he gets started, and in 120 days, he hands NASA a solution um, that was superior to what they'd worked on for 30 years. Was he took home the princely sum of thirty thousand um, dollars. The other example is uh, how do you exercise in space? Um, the uh, you you don't you don't stop and realize no matter how much you've invested in exercise equipment or how much the gym that you attend has invested in exercise equipment, it all stops working if you take gravity away. You know nature is supplying for free the most crucial component of your exercise program. Not even your treadmill is any good if you take gravity away. Um, and certainly that weight set, uh, 135 pounds hanging off the end of the barbells, uh, it doesn't really mean anything uh, without gravity. And so how do they exercise in space uh, in zero gravity? That's actually one of the huge problems. Um, and the solution was uh, Alex, who uh, was born in Leningrad, had moved to Massachusetts, um, and he says, you know, if you're an outsider, you can suggest new ways of looking at things without feeling crazy. This freedom allowed me to develop a novel solution from a challenge description that was so well written and clearly defined. I mean, I mean, it sounds like we fed him this quote and said, Alex, would you make this quote uh, to back up all the points we want to make? Uh, but that really wasn't the case. Um, and, and I won't go into uh, um, his tension band um, Type, type solutions. Now that was the same picture I showed and I, I told you at the time that this was NASA um, challenge in tapping the world. Um, yes? Um, what are the uh, IP rights around this emission? I'm really curious to know if they... Yeah. 
Um, you know, intellectual property uh, is probably a lecture uh, on its own, to tell you the truth. And we've experimented with lots of different kinds. And what we do right now is we simply make it transparent to you what the intellectual property terms are. Let me just see if, when I go back up here, if I've got, I don't, these, are, these have all been excerpted. Um, but if you went to the web page, uh, it would say on there, theoretical dash licensing. And if you were a regular solver, you would know that what that meant was that you don't have to reduce your solution to practice. In other words, you don't have to show that it actually works by doing anything mechanical. We will accept a theoretical argument from you. And licensing means that they will only ask for a non-exclusive right to practice your invention. They will not ask you to transfer the IP to them, which means you could sell it to somebody else, or you could use it on your own, or do anything you want with it. So theoretical dash licensing becomes a very short uh, way of describing what a lot of the requirements are. And, and every one of the challenges will say reduction to practice dash transfer, meaning you've got to show that it actually works in the lab. And when you cash the check, the intellectual property will be transferred from you to Procter & Gamble, uh, or whoever it might be. You're, you're, you're basically tell, you're telling them a few things. You're telling them that if they come up with a solution and they don't feel, I, we, we, we give people the right to unilaterally um, remove themselves at any time up until they've cashed the check. And so if you were to like see a challenge and work on it and, and invent something that you thought you wanted the rights to and you didn't want to transfer it and it said IP transfer uh, on the challenge, then you would not submit it. You would go ahead and go out and patent it. Now, if you could only have made the invention by reading confidentially disclosed material at the detailed level of the challenge, you may not be able to practice your invention because it may infringe on that, uh, on that material. But on the other hand, you would have the right at any step to unilaterally separate yourself from the kinds of agreements uh, that you've made and pursue any other course you wanted. Um, I actually thought that was going to be a major issue when we launched the company. But it turns out that it has happened like maybe once or twice in the 1400 examples. Um, and, and usually it's because to, to practice um, or to pursue intellectual property on your own is an expensive proposition. There's going to be a transaction cost. There's going to be a risk associated with it. Whereas the transfer here is $50,000, no risk case close. So people are weighing, you know, a higher risk, higher return against a lower risk, lower return, um, and they're mostly falling out on the side of um, opting for the no upfront and everything else. Any other questions? I'm going to, I'm going to work because I wanted to, you know, this, this would leave us a good 15 minutes. So I'm just going to jump to the last slide here because um, I, I, I don't think it, uh, it's going to mean a lot to spend much more time on, um, on, uh, on, on examples. And, and I do want to kind of point out uh, why um, I've tried to make the argument that in the future, the only real sources of, of competitive advantage won't be the fact that you own all the experts, OK? That's, that was the paranoia Bill Joy was trying to inject in the system, is that if you thought you could own expertise in some area and win on that basis alone, remember the smart people argument. And if, and if Bill Joy didn't convince you not to try that, remember my argument, which is most of the world's in the green. Not only most of the world, but most of the probability density function is in the green. That's where problems can be solved, not only over here with the Nobel laureate parking space uh, program. So it's the fact that companies are learning to tap into this that is something that you can't compete on. So the basis of your competition doesn't become your ability to out-innovate. It becomes the fundamental strategies you've got and the or your ability to orchestrate. This is why you know the book was called The Open Innovation Marketplace, is how do you manage that marketplace as a whole with all of its different sources of innovation available to you. And I've only talked about one type of innovation here today. It means that that translates into the need to have open business models, which I'm sure you'll talk about in most of the classes you take 
uh, from, from Henry at one time or another. You will be talking about these open business models. And if you need a, a, a short way to remember it, remember the story of scarcity versus plenty. One's an open business model, one's a closed business model. Um, and, and they do illustrate how very, very different it is and why putting Amazon and Barnes and Nobles in the same category is only about books. It's not at all about, uh, about business uh, strategy or models. And in fact, as you know, uh, Amazon, you buy a lot more from Amazon than you can from Barnes and Nobles. And I don't just mean the books that nobody read yesterday. I mean everything. Um, talent management, um, it becomes managing the long tails. The human resources departments of the world have never been about human resources. They've been about employees. Uh, they wanted to evolve beyond that, so they changed their name from personnel to human resources, and they still dealt only with the employees. Now, the human talent organizations of the future, talent management of the future, is where human resources really stops and says, this is about human resources. And human resources is about that whole collection from the green to the blue to the yellow to the orange and how I access and bring talent to bear on any given problem. That'll be very different. And this challenge culture, this recognition that you know, the role of a challenge is to clarify, it's to make work distributable, it's to shift to here and now from there and then, it's to do these kinds of thing, things. And that starts to look like a, a company composition, a, a business world that's quite distinctive from the one that we live in today. Although, um, shareholder value will still, uh, at the end of the day, be the consequence of that. And companies that learn how to orchestrate networks, learn to adopt those kinds of principles, are going to be the ones that uh, create that shareholder value. So with that, let me uh, open it up uh, in general uh, to uh, to the class, see what questions you might have, and uh, we'll take these questions for about uh, 15 or uh, 20 minutes, and, and I think uh, Henry's going to pass out some forms. What feedback have you gotten from your solvers, and what have, if you've collected any, and what have you kind of used that to do, what have you done with that? Industry? Yeah, we collect feedback all the time. I mean, we basically, um, in that sense, I've got 250,000 employees. I'm the biggest company on the planet. Um, so in, in some sense, we recognize these as part of our network, part of our community, um, and we survey them all the time. If we go into a new business line or we have a new challenge type, we'll ask them what they think. Um, we'll ask them what can we do differently. We'll post our own challenges and ask them to, um, to build marketing materials for us, uh, ask them to put together videos to recruit other solvers. Um, we, will, we will actually engage with them uh, as if they were a part of, uh, of a community. So we, we do uh, view our solver network uh, as more than just a kind of distance, arm length uh, organization. And do they see themselves as a community? Like, are there any connections within that community? Is it all just uh, specific problem based and, you know, it dissolves and comes back together and solves problems in that way? You, you, you wouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, you saw the kinds of problems that we work on. You can imagine their level of complexity. Uh, you you kind of know what social profiles go with what technical skills. So if you thought of them as a little bit of a nerdy antisocial community, you'd probably be right um, to a large degree. Um, and so they're not likely to share family photos on, uh, um, on in a Senate book uh, or, or whatever it might be. They really are about the intellectual challenge of the problems. They like demonstrating their cred. Uh, they like being um, multiple solvers in the community, of which there's a very small handful for all the green zone arguments is why there's only a small handful. Um, but we're always looking for ways to up that sense of community. And what we'll probably install before the year is over is kind of a point system so that engagement earns you points even if you're not a final awardee. Over here, and then uh, we'll go back to that corner. Yeah, go ahead and uh, I'm blue and... Yeah, unlike, unlike eBay, um, where you, know, you can always go get some more Hummels at the next uh, garage sale um, and market them and sell them, um, this probably doesn't lend itself as well. However, there are some sub-challenge types where people have done pretty well. We've distributed 
uh, around $400,000 to individuals who will supply tiny micro and milligram quantities of novel molecular structures that aren't commercially available anywhere. And so um, we've, got, we've got some individuals, um, particularly in old Eastern Bloc companies, that are probably paying a, a large number of their bills uh, off, of, off of that little subset of problem types. But for a problem like the forecasting of solar events, it's probably not, I mean, you don't live so far here to the left that your spike is so high that you can say, I'll make a business out of it. Yeah, ba um, oh, okay, well, we had, we had one back, back corner, oh. and then we'll come back over, over the... Well, why don't you ask your question and just repeat the question so we can get it on the video. Okay. Part of me wishes they would copy it. It's a it's a validation, you know, flattery and all that, uh, uh, flattery and all that stuff. Um, there are some there are some groups copying it. Hippios um, does pretty much a copy of it from uh, um, in French um, and kind of targeted to a French community. Uh, there are some other uh, language specific copies. Idea Connection basically takes our problems and then tries to um, promulgate promote them in a in a a, a much more heavily managed community and environment. So not only do they copy our idea, sometimes they'll even copy our challenges. And then what will happen is someone from Idea Connection will become the solver, and then they'll funnel it back to the Idea Connection site. So, so it, you know, we've got, um, you know, we've got uh, prior art. Uh, we've got uh, patent applications. You know, we've, we've done the usual. Um, but on the other hand, it, it turns out that having a large network, being able to articulate a problem clearly, um, and I didn't spend a lot, of, I spent a lot of time talking about the value of a good challenge, but I didn't tell you what some of the, the tricks were that we would be teaching you um, as a customer for how to do that. Uh, those are harder for them to replicate um, and having a, a dedicated community. And of course, we're fighting back by saying, hey, you know, if you don't want to use us, we'll still post. You can see right there on the site if you went to the Challenge Center. You'll see it says External Challenges. So if Netflix doesn't want to work with us and offer a prize out there, uh, we'll point our solvers to it because at the end of the day, that's a way of serving them is giving them uh, one-stop shopping, one shopping for um, problem solving. Here and then we'll... Hi. Um, do you do anything... As somebody who might participate in one of those competitions, I always think, especially if these are very complicated problems, do I want to spend 300 hours on my own of volunteer time and not know what I could get back? Especially if it's a good answer, but somebody's is a little bit better or is chosen. Um, I don't know what you could do, but do you have any tricks to deal with that motivation issue? Yeah. So, so you just um, put your finger right on the, on the, on the reason why after I gave McKinsey a million dollars, they said we can't tell you the answer, is because they had, they had no way of knowing whether people would go at risk. Why should you go at risk when normally the, comp the company's employees aren't at risk? They know they're going to get their paycheck whether they solve the problem or not. They may not keep their job for a long time, but they at least know that they're de-risked for that 300 hours of work. Uh, that's coming up immediately. So understanding the motivations was uh, was a huge trick uh, to figuring out how to how to make this happen. And it's it's about um, the intellectual challenge of it. Uh, it's about getting um, recognition on our site uh, as the one who solved the problem. It's about Bruce Cragen being the subject of of some uh, uh, business case uh, business cases, and you know. Uh, a little bit of notoriety, although he's not really a fame-seeking uh, kind of an individual. He just wanted to solve that problem. I mean, that's all there was to it. And if it took him 300 hours, uh, he was ready to go to work and do it. And if he didn't solve it, um, the 300 hours were time he would have considered as well spent as uh, golfing. 
So we spend a lot of time looking at what the motivation factors are. All I can say is that we were wrong when we assumed what the motivators would be. What happened was when we got into a large population, we found there are more motivations than you can even imagine for why people will do this. And you just got to look at um, each of them. But it's usually some type of intrinsic reward system uh, that gets them to make that commitment. Um, yes. Have you seen any gray market? Um, yeah, for example, like if Samsung posts any problem and, you know, employee at Apple, they see a challenge and they actually solve and deliver it to Apple or... You mean, you mean well, there's a couple like, ways gray markets yeah, could occur. Or like if, for example, like BMW posts, you know, any problem and then any participant see that and they solve and then they deliver it to Mercedes. Okay, yeah. So, so, so we, one of the reasons we don't post who's asking the challenge, who, who's, whose challenge it is, is to prevent the scenario where people will say, if BMW is interested in that, so must Mercedes be. I'll go to them and try to get uh, a bigger, uh, a bigger cash uh, amount of cash. Um, it, it's, it's surprisingly, um, blinding what not knowing who's asking the question means. And the second thing is that we ask the questions in a very general way. So let's suppose it was a problem with a, a piece of metal uh, failing uh, due to overheating due to under lubricating that we were working on for uh, BMW. By the time we got done writing that challenge, you wouldn't know whether you were working for BMW, an oil company, a metallurgy company, US Steel, um, you know, we would abstract that problem in such a way, and that's part of the, the secret sauce that we offer, is we would abstract that problem in such a way that it would be very, very difficult. Um, we haven't seen it, but we think because we take some active steps to prevent making that attractive, financially attractive, uh, to, to gray market um, strategists. Yeah, I had a quick question. You said that uh, NASA, the seven projects, seven of them were completed, but yeah. what is the overall success rate? And so uh, I'm just trying to understand what, how do people feel when a project sure. is not accepted and what happens to the incentives? Yeah. It seems like they could be misaligned at that point. It's about 40%. Um, now, in some sub-problem types, like the ideation challenge, we actually make it 100%. Because we say, if all you're looking for is a global brainstorming session and people are offering you top-of-mind solutions, you know, you don't have to attach $50,000 bounties to them. We'll accept $5,000. But you know what? You pay it out to the person who had the best idea, not necessarily to somebody that met criteria A through F. And so in some cases, we force it to 100%. The 40% was before we even did any of those. So the number's creeping up. But it's creeping up because of throwing into the mix uh, some 100% type things. 40% is still, you know, you saw the complexity of the problems. Believe me, 40% is a pretty good de-risking. And in fact, if a company worked on, on, on 10, it means they would pay out on four. And by paying out on four instead of having to pay people for working on all 10, of which they might solve three and they might solve five if they were internal employees, you still get an economically um, attractive um, advantage to using this channel uh, versus employees. So Alf, another part of that question would be, for any given challenge, there might be five, ten, or more people competing to solve the problem. Yes. So you're saying 40% of the challenges are solved. Yes. Uh, but the odds of any individual solver getting paid would be one fifth or tenth or whatever of the forty percent. Right, that's that's okay. right, and and um, so so again, you know, you have to recognize the motivation goes back to intrinsic, not not just to uh, to winning. So the motivations there remain somewhat undiluted by whether you won or not. I'm not going to say people are indifferent to whether or not they win. They're clearly not. Um, they're in it to win, um, but but there is some. Uh, payout they receive by engaging. The, the other thing is that there are a lot of people who look at these and say, well, I was working on that anyway. You know, if you imagine uh, an academic, um, I, I think this is 
well illustrated when I was kind of shopping this around. I came to Berkeley, by the way, came to Stanford, UC Davis. I sort of made a, a little tour of licensing departments and deans. I described the concept and I said, what do you think? Would your, would your organizations work on this? And, and, and I had this uh, professor at Stanford by the name of Tom Wandless say, no, 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 I, I, I got a research program. It's completely important to me. Um, I, I'll, I'm going to pursue my research program. So no, I, I, wouldn't, be, uh, I wouldn't be a user uh, of, your, uh, of your services. And then um, he says, oh, but by the way, if you ever post any challenges looking for new synthetic routes to dehydro amino acids, um, I'd like to work on those because that's what I'm already going to be doing. Um, <laughs> and I wouldn't mind putting your compound in my table. So then I realized, well, wait a minute, that's all I need is I just need to get this to enough minds that they're going to say, well, I was going to do this anyway. And it sort of starts to uh, address, the, uh, address the whole motivation issue. Um, I think we're uh, running out of time. But before we lose this slide, one of the things I wanted to just use as a method of closure, this notion of scarcity versus plenty. When Alf was first developing this idea, he was at Eli Lilly, a big company lots of problems, and lots of problems that hadn't yet been solved. So initially, they were thinking about how to solve Lily's problems by getting outside people to work on them. But then Alf got to thinking, how do you get all these people to work on just Lily's problems? If you made other companies' problems available alongside Lily's problems, you'd have a lot more problems on your site. That makes you much more interesting to solvers out in the world. The more solvers you can attract into your community, the more interesting you are as a place for other companies with problems that need to be solved to go to uh, and it's an example of a two-sided market where each side feeds the other side, and it creates a virtuous cycle. And to me, this is the biggest competitive advantage they've got, is this, this two-sided dimensions on both sides. They've got the broadest set of problems and the biggest community addressing the problems. And even if you carbon copied every single thing they've done, how do you carbon copy the 250 or 300,000, however many it is now, uh, in the solver community, uh, and the, the what, 1,400 solutions that have already been generated, uh, somebody else trying to do that from scratch has to compete with something they didn't have to compete with. Nobody else was doing this at the time that they created this. Now, there are others out there doing it, so it's going to be even harder to get such a community going now. So to me, that's the biggest IP that they've got. It's Please why, join why are there no competitors to eBay, or not substantial ones? Yeah. You know? It's because the world's actually better off with one eBay. I know where I can go to look for stuff. I know where I can go to sell stuff. And, and so, you know, another thing to think about in your open business models is the number of these things that can become natural monopolies, not monopolies through control principles and destruction of Yeah, not monopolies through scarcity, but monopolies through monopolies plenty. Monopolies through plenty, yeah. In fact, uh, John Lechleiter, who Alf has already introduced to you as the CEO of Lilly, told me about this company in a center that this company could be the eBay of science. So interesting note to, to end on. Please join me in thanking our speaker. <laughs>